So here in 2018 with Sally Wienström, Linköping University in uh, Sweden. Sally, thanks very much for a great interview. Thank you. Um, so my first question, um, which I like to do in these kind of interviews, is to maybe ask you um, how you got interested in discursive psychology. In the first place. In the first place. In the first place. Maybe, yeah. Um, so yeah, the first time I came across discursive psychology, or DP, was during my undergraduate degree, which was um, at Dundee University in Scotland. And it was quite a traditional psychology degree, as it was in those days, in the mid-1990s. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of cognitive psychology and behaviorism and things. Um, but in my final year, I was lucky enough to be able to take um, an optional module with Nick Hopkins, which is on discourse and social psychology. And it was that module that introduced me to Potter and Wetherill's Discourse and Social Psychology book mm -hmm. and um, Nick Billig's Arguing Thinking. Okay. So it was a very much a, a big change from the rest of my undergraduate degree. It was totally different. And that's, that really opened my eyes to DP in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's where I first came across it. Yeah, well, and, and so and that kind of led you in some fashion to Loughborough when you did your PhD. Um, yeah. Then you had drunk and possible shorts, if you like that. Yeah, but it wasn't a straightforward sort of, it looks on paper, it looks like this very smooth transition. Okay. And I don't know about other people if they have like a, a road mapped out for them, probably don't. But for me, I left um, Dundee not really knowing what I was going to do mm. um, afterwards. Certainly, I didn't think I would do a PhD. But sort of personal circumstances um, meant that I moved to Nottingham. Mm. And um, so I was sort of in a new place and kind of want, looking for a way in which I could continue with psychology in some way or research or something, but I had no idea how. Mm. Um, and so I spent quite a bit of time, I was working sort of part-time just doing casual, casual jobs as you do to get some money, mm. and I spent a lot of time phoning up various uh, university psychology departments in the area, Loughborough and Nottingham, Nottingham Trent, I'm basically trying to find some sort of way, way in to, to do some research work or something. And as um, part of that, I ended up on the phone to Mick Billig. Oh, wow. As okay. you do. <laughs> yeah. uh, just amazingly, which is quite, um, mm. quite surprising considering I've just finished reading his book. Uh -huh. And um, it was Mick who suggested that I maybe think about doing a part-time PhD. Mm. Because for me at the time, I thought, well, I didn't really think I was cut out to do a PhD. I did, certainly didn't have money to do a PhD. But the part-time option meant I could work and then still be able to support myself. And I also thought, well, if I start part-time, um, if it doesn't work out, I can just, I can just walk away. And uh, no one's harmed in the process and no <laughs> one's invested too much in me. Um, so, so that's what I did. And it was Mick who suggested I talked to Jonathan. Uh, Potter, and uh, so I remember coming in and having a meeting with Jonathan and Eric Edwards, so that was a, sort of a double whammy of starstruckness at the same time. Um, and yeah, talking to them, and I must have convinced them that I had at least enough to get me started anyway. Mm -hmm. and, uh, wow. So it, was sort of, it felt sort of, sort of serendipitous that I ended up doing a PhD when I hadn't planned it, I just happened to be in the, sure. in the area. And um, I just wonder if you could maybe say, say that something about the topic of your PhD. Um, sure. How would that happen? I mean, <laughs> how would that? I mean, it's, uh, yeah, mm. it's quite specific. Uh, yeah, it is quite specific. Uh, so my PhD is on um, food evaluations or food assessments in family mm. meal times. So as part of those conversations that I had with Jonathan in the early, t in the early sort of stages, I didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to do. Mm. Um, I knew I wanted to do, do something on food and eating, something around identities maybe. It was super vague. Um, and at the time, Jonathan had an undergraduate student, Amy Wildsmith, who was uh, interested in similar issues, and she had collected family meal time data. Mm -hmm. 
So Jonathan suggested that we work together for a bit, and then I collected my own data. And the family meal times was really, it came about through very practical requirements. So we wanted to get a setting where people were talking about food or eating on a regular basis, where they wouldn't really be moving about so we could record them. Mm-hmm. And this was before, vid- well, it wasn't before video, <laughs> sounds <laughs> much longer ago than it really was. Um, but it was, um, we had, I had cassette recorders rather than videos at the time. Mm-hmm. So the choice of having family meal times was pretty much for practical reasons. And I tried recording groups of students or groups of young working adults, but they just, they just never really met together as regularly as, say, a family with young children might do. Um, and it was way before I had any children of my own, so I wasn't really interested in the, fam- in the parent-child dynamics, actually. <laughs> um, so when I got started and looking at these family meal times for a while, I was actually quite um, a little bit frustrated that they were quite mundane topics and it wasn't really uh, exciting stuff that I thought we would be talking about. There's a lot of very simple things around, well, do you like your chicken? Yeah, it's quite nice. Um, Very (laughs) mundane evaluations. Um, But then, of course, from there I realised that these very mundane and very, um, yeah, very frequent and very seemingly unconsequential things actually had a huge part to play. And... um, I mean, I'm still looking at food evaluations in meal times now. Actually, <laughs> I haven't really, far, I haven't really moved moved on very far mm-hmm. in that sense. Yeah. And then, um, can I just ask, how was it having Jonathan as a supervisor? He was he was very good. I yeah, I <laughs> he was very supportive. He was very enthusiastic. He was the kind of supervisor where. Um, even if you felt that you weren't really sure what you were doing, which I wasn't in the early days, I'm sometimes still not sure what I'm doing actually, um, but he sort of would help support you and encourage you through those times. So he's the kind of supervisor who, even if you didn't quite believe yourself, he would see something, some potential. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, very good. <laughs> um, so I know I'm not just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and obviously, when you were here, you were uh, involved in dog. Um, how was the experience at that time? Um, are there any sort of particularly memorable sessions? That you can... um, yeah, well, dog at the time was really exciting because there was quite a large intake of postgrads mm. in the sort of mid nineties and towards the turn of the, turn of the century. Mm. Um, so we had a very good supportive collective group um, and many of the postgrads were coming from quite different mm. backgrounds and had very different topics, so that was very good. Mm. The dark sessions were just, it, it was, I think one of the best things was the fact that we, they were so regular. That there was this regular meeting that you know every Wednesday at one o'clock you'd meet, and even if you felt you didn't have anything to say, you could still go along and learn an awful lot. Um, as for ones that stood out, I don't think there's any in particular, but I think what was kind of refreshing to see was that there was. Often there could often be quite an edginess to, to the dark sessions where the where the is it still like that now? Do you get that? I, I can't comment. You can't comment. <laughs> but in a, it's a very supportive and very professional manner. So you would sometimes see you know some of the academic staff gently challenging each other on their ideas, whether it's analysis or theory, sometimes political. So, and that was very exciting. And as a postgrad, you often just sat and watched and listened and learned. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah, and just to see these sort of, you know, all these sort of theoretical and analytical debates getting, getting played out in front of you. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was really good. Yeah. So, this interview is in a, in a particular room, uh, yes. a particularly beautiful room uh, yeah, yes. in Rockington Building. Yes. Um, so, th- this room is actually where you spent your time here? Or? Yeah, it's a substantial part of my time. So my desk was actually here. Okay. 
Uh, so this wall uh -huh. will be a different colour as well, but then to, uh, there is a nice view of the trees and grass and yeah. squirrels. Yeah. Um, but I was very close to the dark room, which was just okay. you know, through them. Okay. Um, was, it, was, it, was it me sharing with other people, other patients? Yes, there was three of us in here. Um, Abby Locke was sitting there, Nikki Parker was sitting there. Then I think we had a bit of a change round, but those are the two people I remember being with. Um, and I was at uh, some other time in another office upstairs, but um, this was my my first sort of own office space. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, um, just kind of, I suppose, moving away from Loughborough now. We're, mm -hmm. we're thinking post you know, post, post Loughborough. Yeah. So, after you, after you finished your PhD, you, went, you lectured in psychology at, at Nottingham Trent. Yes. Um, and then you the University of Strathclyde. Yes. I'm moving you very fast here. Yeah, that's fine. Um, uh, where you became senior lecturer in psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and is that Strathclyde you pioneered the use of problem based learning? Yes. Um, which has continued at Lingshire. Yeah. Today. yeah. Um, uh, I just wondered if you could talk a bit about experience with problem based learning. Okay. Sure. It's maybe a bit much to say I pioneered it totally. Uh, so I think I was one of the people who helped to try and introduce it into the psychology program at Strathclyde when I was there. There have been many other people who have been doing lots more since then. But pro problem-based learning, or PBL, um, started out for me as a, a different pedagogical approach, which it, which it is. Mm -hmm. It's a different way of students learning and for you to teach, which shifts the responsibility more into the students and, and encouraging them to be motivated and to solve problems sort of on their own but in a supportive way. So it's quite challenging um, and for many students and tutors it can often be quite a confusing um, process to get, to get into it. But it sort of starts out for me as a way to try and enliven research methods teaching, which I've done quite a lot of and try and make that a little bit more interesting for the students. Um, but actually, once I started using it in my teaching, I became more and more aware of how, how much research can then offer for PBL. Because if you've got a teaching approach or a learning approach where students are sitting and talking in groups every week um, for an hour or two a week, they, they, and they're meant to be learning within that group setting. What you have then there is a, a context in which the social interaction is as important as the, the so-called learning or the knowledge that's being generated or um, collaboratively produced. Mm -hmm. So I kind of started off uh, thinking this is a really interesting approach to use in my teaching and then I have now been moved to actually recording PBL sessions and, and analysing it along with students as well, PhD students too. Wow, so it's really good, you really sort of, you started something quite, quite big, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I mean there are other people around the world who are doing sort of similar things, but it, for me it was quite a nice way to kind of combine teaching and research, which we're encouraged to do, but it's often quite hard. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. quite exciting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just, um, just moving on to your research and you, uh, your career so far, you've been um, involved in some fantastic research, kind of mm -hmm. the, 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 the mealtime evaluations, yeah. um, work on uh, NSPC, healthline interactions, um, other work in the NHS um, um, involving weight management treatment. Yeah. Um, and you've also uh, authored a, a fantastic dis discursive psychology book in um, 2017. Yeah, um, I just wonder if you could maybe um, talk about, about your research in general uh, and maybe what you're doing currently, current interests. Yeah. Um, I guess I haven't, as I said, I haven't really strayed too far from those early, uh, early years with my PhD. Um, so a lot of my research, although I've sort of um, looked at a few different things, the core of my research I still feel is that the family meal times and looking at how how psychological aspects of eating, like appetite, like food preferences, like disgust, how those are kind of managed and when and how they're made consequential in interaction. So food preferences, for example, whether you like or don't like a food, it still surprises me how central that is to so many of our how so much of our understanding around food and eating, 
not just for families, but for adults and um, other kids. So, so yeah, so a lot of my research is still driven by trying to find answers to some of those questions of what, what's going on when we're talking about food preferences or um, uh, when we reject or accept foods, what, what else happens there? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> and um, we, we worked at Big Shipping. Mm -hmm. Is there um, much opportunity for collaborating across departments or across schools? Yeah, yeah, very much so. I think, um, I'm not sure whether it's typical of Swedish uh, education or sort of other European countries as well, but there's a very good sense of collaboration and interdisciplinarity, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, that although I'm based in the psychology department, I have strong collaborations with uh, researchers in um, culture and communication and child studies and social work. Mm -hmm. So, and there's a, there's a really strong uh, interaction sort of research community um, mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. which is, is very nice. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about um, do you have like any um, particularly um, favourite research that you've done, or even any favourite kind of extracts that you've looked at? Any particular kind of things that stick out as something that really draws you into your way of um, using discursive psychology? Yeah. Um, I guess uh, yeah. I don't really have a favourite such, but the 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 work on the Gustave treatments was particularly fun to do and that has still kind of stayed with me even after all these years and and then I sort of um, once I'd done that sort of food pleasure sort of side of things it wasn't long before I needed to turn to the slightly darker side of eating as it were and look at disgust so the the work on the, all the yucky stuff and the disgust uh, response is, has been one of my favourites here, and I'm, oh. I mean, I'm not finished with that yet, there's still lots more to... There's, there's lots more discussed. So. There's lots more <laughs> to discuss about <laughs> discussed. <laughs> um, yeah. And through your career, so far, has there been any particular kind of challenging types of research, or research that um, maybe has been difficult to get published for whatever reason? Mm. Um, I think the only challenges are that it just takes <laughs> it just takes a long time, uh, and I wish I could get things done a bit quicker. But sort of um, other uh, working and life commitments kind of nicely take up my time. Um, so yeah, the only challenge is to keep going. I think, and um, I like to be thorough. So if I think I'm seeing, uh, I think there might be some extract that I want to look at, I want to check through all the other data that I've got to make sure that there isn't anything else. So that takes a lot of time. Um, so yeah, and getting published I think, like most authors I guess, it's a case of finding the right, the right outlet, the right audience for your work. Um, and yeah, you get rejected or you get uh, criticism or quite harsh evaluations, but often that helps to make the final product that much better. Mm -hmm. um, so, and actually if I've been rejected from, from one journal and felt quite, um, quite disappointed by that, soon after you think, well actually, this is another journal and it ends up there and it's so much better there anyway. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of the usual challenges of getting published. Um, yeah. And we always need more time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and just to, looking ahead, I guess, um, do you have any plans for future research? Uh, always. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so more work on, I really want to dig more into food preferences. And mm. uh, although it might feel like I've done it, I feel there's a lot more to go. So more on the food preferences, more on the meal stuff, or maybe going beyond the family meal to other areas and definitely exploring more PBL interaction. Um, so I'm working at the moment with a large corpus of uh, Swedish problem-based learning settings, so we've got plenty of data to examine there. Uh -huh. So that will keep me busy for a bit longer as well, uh -huh. so trying to keep those two strands going. Mm. Um, and a, and a, a final question. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about kind of uh, discussive scholars as, a, as, a, as an approach to interaction, I just wonder from your experience what DP 
kind of brings to the social interaction table that, mm -hmm. that other approaches neglect or, or don't. Mm. I guess it depends on um, what you compare it to, mm. um, whether it's CA or psychology. But I think for me, what DP adds is it sort of provides a bridge between what is typically seen as psychological and internal and individual to the social and the interactional. And it allows us to look at those things without having to try and get inside people's heads, without trying to uh, figure out cognitive processes. You can't do that, of course, but you can look at it another way. Mm. So that providing that bridge. Um, and yeah, it's also, um, I think, very applied in the same way that, of course, other interactional process and um, research is applied, in that we analyze data that's taken from real life and therefore if you want to instead of having to do research in a lab and then apply it to real life we have it already there so in comparison to say some other um, psychological work then we can add something that's already based in in real life contexts and it's i mean it gives us a way to look at just all the messy details of everyday life you know, it provides us as with a way of doing that. Again, other approaches do too, but I think for me, DP offers something that allows you to do that and still keep those, still look at issues that have typically been treated as sort of cognitive psychology or, or that sort of thing. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Thank you, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you.